Hi, I'm Keith Rittmaster here at the North Carolina Maritime Museum, standing underneath the skeleton of a 33 and a half foot male sperm whale, and standing next to the real heart from that whale. Now, I don't want to pretend that I know a whole lot about heart anatomy or physiology, but this heart has taught me a lot about kindness and generosity because four veterinarians conspired to prepare it and study it and ultimately get it back here so it could be displayed beneath the whale from which it came. I happen to be holding, well, maybe you'll take a second to figure out what I'm holding. It is the aorta of the heart that fit right on top but the veterinarians cut it off so that you could actually peer in the top and maybe see some of the valves that are inside the heart. There are a lot of similarities to our hearts. There are four chambers, and if you've ever used the term or heard of the term, it tugged at my heartstrings, there's actually an anatomical basis for that, and it's these tendons in the ventricles that in uh, humans is more like strings, in whales it's more like a cable. But those are um, uh, tendons that are often referred to as heart strings. Um, there are many features of the heart that reflect adaptations to a deep, high pressure, cold marine environment of a huge animal, the size and the shape and the, and the relative size of the musculature in the heart. Uh, a veterinarian could talk about that much better than I. And to prepare the heart, they cut out a window. So this is the piece that fit right there. But they thought it would be neat to be able to peer inside. So how is this done? Uh, it was, it's a process called plastination. And basically it involves dehydrating all the cells in the heart with acetone, several soaks, putting it in a cold vacuum, adding liquid silicone, this is slightly oversimplification, and then slowly raising the temperature and releasing the vacuum. And it's a process called plastination. If you've heard of the Body Works exhibit, that's an example of plastination that tours the globe. And so this is a very unique specimen uh, a very fresh, dead sperm whale's heart. If you stick around, there will be a presentation that describes the whale stranding and many aspects of getting this skeleton to the Maritime Museum in Beaufort. Thanks for your interest. Greetings. The picture on the left in this opening slide is of a fresh dead sperm whale that's stranded alive at Cape Lookout in January of 2004. The skeleton of that whale went on display at the North Carolina Maritime Museum in March of 2012, a little over eight years later, and that's shown on the right. What the heck took so long? I'm Keith. Rittmaster of the North Carolina Maritime Museum and the Bonehenge Whale Center, and I'm about to tell you what took so long. I want to introduce you to the Marine Mammal Stranding Network, and that's a group of biologists and veterinarians, educators, volunteers. Uh, the organizations on the lower left, listed on the lower left of this slide, are the ones that take leadership roles in the Marine Mammal Stranding Network, and we get the calls of dead or dying or entangled marine mammals in North Carolina, and we respond to those. And that is the source of much of the uh, whale, dolphin, porpoise, skeletal material that we work on. And in the next 35 or 40 minutes, I'm going to cover all the aspects of this case that are listed here on this slide. First, 
20 seconds of taxonomy here. Cetacea refers to whales, dolphins, and porpoises. It's a taxonomic term. So they are cetaceans. They are in the taxonomic order Cedartiodactyla. And within that order are two subgroups or suborders. Whale taxonomy is in flux right now. Um, and the two groups are Otontoceti, it's the first one, refers to toothed whales. And the other one is Mysticeti, which is baleen whales. All I'm going to discuss today is the largest, is the largest of the toothed whales, sperm whales. Graphically, it looks like this. This poster reflects all of the cetaceans worldwide as of about 10 years ago when this poster was published. Uh, since then, at least one has gone extinct, one is on its way to extinction, one has been discovered, another one is about to be named. So again, whale taxonomy is in flux. Uh, in this poster, all the baleen whales are facing to the right. The biggest one is the blue whale. And all the toothed whales are facing to the left. And the top right of this poster is the largest of the toothed whales, the sperm whale. And again, that's the only one I'm going to discuss today. There is the sperm whale. This is an oversimplification, but I just wanted to uh, emphasize that different types of whales were sought after in North Carolina and different products were derived from those whales. The primary targets were sperm whales, right whales, and bottlenose dolphins. Sperm whales. They are very wide ranging from the ice pack through the tropics down to the ice pack the females and young are restricted to approximately 40 degrees north and 40 degrees south, whereas the mature males are the ones that roam further um, toward the poles into the cooler water. That star is where we are in North Carolina. So here we do see uh, mature males as well as females and their young. If a sperm whale stranded up at Cape Cod or Nova Scotia, I would with pretty much confidence uh, predict it would be a male. This is a presumed mom sperm whale with her newborn calf. The calf's blow is in the middle of the picture. They're both facing to the left. Mom's dorsal hump is to the right side of the calf. And here's an interesting thing about sperm whales. Females top out at about 35 or 36 feet long. That would be old age for a female, but males get much longer, 60 feet, some reports of even longer than that. So more than any other cetacean, they are, the term is sexually dimorphic. When we saw this, what ended up being a nursery group of sperm whales, the fishermen on the boat said, oh, let's catch some squid. Because they knew associated with a nursery group of sperm whales will be a lot of squid. Because the hungriest sperm whales out there will be the lactating females. Ask your mothers. So they put their lines overboard to catch squid. So this is one of the large squid that the uh, fishermen caught. And I'm going to show you next, that's my friend Rick holding it. Uh, I'm going to show you the beak, the hard part of the mouth from this squid, which happened to be very tasty. And that is the beak. And those are the pieces we look for in whale stomachs to indicate that the whale had eaten squid, if we were investigating a stranding. 
And some people are very good at identifying what species of squid, and I will get to that shortly. Of course, there weren't any cameras, let alone digital cameras during the whaling days. So much of the offshore whaling for sperm whales is depicted in artwork and uh, typically uh, show a mother ship, a large sailboat with smaller boats that are actually used to uh, attack the sperm whales. This is another piece of artwork depicting sperm whaling. I got this from Hal Whitehead's book, Sperm Whales. I, I think he's considered as one of the uh, forefathers of a sperm whale, wild sperm whale research. And it's about 200 years on the bottom axis and on the vertical axis, uh, thousands of whales killed. And so I just wanted you to see the trend. I think everyone would agree this is an underestimate, but the trend's what's interesting. What began as an open boat hunt or whaling, some might uh, reasonably consider was sustainable. And then the modern hunts are what really devastated sperm whales and pretty much all of their range. But there's some interesting dates I want to point out. One is the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania, which probably took a little bit of pressure off sperm whales. Hence the catches reflected in this graph are declining. But then in the early 1900s, exploding harpoons and factory ships and multi-year voyages seeking primarily sperm whales uh, began to proliferate, proliferate uh, globally and the catches just skyrocketed, went totally unsustainable. Sperm whales became um, near extinct, economically extinct in much of their range. And then there was a global moratorium on whaling and the Endangered Species Act and Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972. And now, at least in this country, we no longer whale for anything. Uh, well, there's a few exceptions in the Arctic, but um, we don't hunt for sperm whales anymore. I got this graphic from the New Bedford, Bedford the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And I just wanted to show you that North Carolina was a whaling destination. It was a hot spot. It doesn't really matter that you see the uh, open or closed colored circles, but just you can see North Carolina is pretty much uh, in the center of what is depicted as uh, the sperm whale kills that were recorded for this map. Sperm whales, wow, oh, they're so weird. They have the biggest brain on earth, although brain to body size isn't all that impressive. Uh, the, but the brain is, well, the only one I saw was about the size of a soccer ball. Uh, and they have the biggest nose on earth, although we don't think they can smell anything. And this sketch shows the head of a sperm whale most of which is not skeletal. It, there's a lot of plumbing in the head and there's a whole lot of spermaceti, which is a waxy oil or an oily wax. And this is the main thing that whalers were after, very valuable. And often in the whaling logs, you could read that they would um, kill a whale, get the spermaceti out of the head and then discard the rest of the whale uh, and go kill another because the spermaceti was so much more valuable than anything else. And not to say they wouldn't use the other parts, but um, by far the most, uh, most valuable part was the spermaceti. Uh, we don't whale for whales, but we still are managing to kill them. This shows an entangled whale, one of the main causes of death. Uh, the top two photos show another cause of death in sperm whales, and that's marine debris in their stomachs. The bottom picture shows a ship strike victim, about five or six propeller strikes you see on the back of this sperm whale. It is facing right. Uh, they all look well healed. This one survived, but often they don't. 
closer to home. This is one that uh, Bill McClellan and team investigated in Avon. This is the stomach contents of, well, uh, Avon's in North Carolina. The, this is the stomach contents of one young sperm whale that came ashore in North Carolina. A uh, lot of rope, a lot of plastic. Uh, more recently, this is from a report of a dead sperm whale in Indonesia, stomach full of mostly plastic trash. I don't know why, but we're learning, we're finding more plastic trash in the deep diving whale's stomachs than in the shallower diving whale's stomachs. Hope someone can help us figure that out someday. And this is a North Carolina case. Uh, just because of its size, I can tell you it is an adult. Well, I can tell you it's a male. Um, and it is most likely an adult. Uh, again, females top out around 35 or 36 feet, and this is much longer than this. And it came ashore in Wrightsville Beach in 1928. This happens to be the specimen, or most of it, that is, uh, oh, this is a picture a few days later of that same whale. Initially, it came ashore alive, I think, and then it was died and dragged offshore and then came ashore again. Adult male sperm whale. And this is the one that's on display, stunning display in uh, Raleigh at the Museum of Natural Sciences. And I went to look at this and I noticed that the skull was um, plaster or casting or it wasn't real, it wasn't bone. And I talked to Paul Nader who did a lot of work on this whale, assembling it and installing it in the museum. And he said, oh, well, it had evidence of having been struck by an exploding harpoon. And if you look at the location of the stranding, North Carolina and the timing, 1920s, that makes a whole lot of sense. And he believes that this adult male whale survived the exploding harpoon from a whaler but succumbed to its injuries and came ashore alive and then died. Now I'm going to bring you back to Carter County, North Carolina, and this case that I am discussing today. So you see Cape Hatteras in the middle on the right, Cape Lookout at the bottom of this image, and I'm going to blow up that square right there, and I'm in a plane looking northish. Cape Lookout, Cape Lookout Bight. You can see Shackleford Banks and beyond that, Harker's Island and the North River. And on a cold January day, we got a call about a live sperm whale on the beach. Uh, it was the Park Service who called me and they said a fisherman had reported it. So we went out to investigate. Now, sperm whales are probably the easiest cetacean to identify. They are pretty bizarre in a lot of ways. Um, and this one uh, uh, shows you a few unique features. It's the only whale that has the blowhole near the front of the head. They have uh, a lot of teeth but they are only in the lower jaws. There are sockets in the upper jaws, um, almost without exception, uh, but as a rule. The big bulge in the head is not the cranium, is not the brain case, it's the spermaceti organ that contains all that oily wax I mentioned. Another picture of it, uh, good look at the blowhole, they are wildly asymmetrical, uh, skeletally, but also externally. Uh, you can probably tell here, but the blowhole isn't just a little bit off center. It's way off to the left in a living sperm whale. And if you, uh, you know, search for videos of sperm whales or even or still images, you will see the blowhole is way off to the left side of the, of the head. So a lot of features make uh, sperm whales pretty easy to identify. Uh, a tooth was extracted. Actually, uh, we took out most of the teeth. 
one thing we can learn from examining a tooth of this whale is the age. So that tooth is right there. And I clean the tooth and cut it on a fancy expensive isomet saw. So I cut it in half lengthwise and that's shown there. I polished the surface. I etched it with acid, formic acid. I applied a little bit of ink from a Sharpie pen and these lines jump out. And similar to rings on a tree, each line we believe refers to a year of growth, enabling me to estimate that this male sperm whale that came ashore and died at Cape Lookout was approximately 15 years old. And it ended up being 33 and a half feet long. Had it been a female that length, it would have been an old lady. It would have been much older and it would have likely had um, 40 or 50 uh, lines in the teeth. But at 33 and a half feet, a male will be young and adolescent. And this one turned out to be approximately 15 years old. That is the necropsy team. A necropsy is an autopsy on a non-human, and that is the whale that they're about to take more measurements than you can imagine possible, and then cut into the whale and look at every system, every organ as much as possible. And they get deep into it. Bruce is cutting off the left flipper, which is a neat part of the story I'll get to in a sec. Uh, John is pulling a rib away uh, in the orange coat so that Paul in the yellow bibs can get to the stomach and the heart. I'm behind John, really excited because I just found something I always wanted to see but had never seen before. I found the spermaceti in the head. And I cut, oh, okay, um, I didn't. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the heart that Paul extracted, very fresh heart from a very uh, recently dead sperm whale. Another interesting part of the story I'll get to. And this is what I found in the head, and it was a, the large reservoir of spermaceti. This is a mammal, so it's warm-blooded, and it was still warm when we were doing the necropsy, even though it was a cold day. Uh, the whale hadn't cooled yet, so the spermaceti in the head flowed, it poured, it, it, it was ginger ale colored, and as soon as it hit the cold February air, it solidified into whitish wax, and you see it here pouring out of the reservoir in the head of that whale, and we collected a bunch of it. I estimated there were probably 20 or 30 gallons, that, uh, most of which we just wasted in the sand. But we collected a lot of it and um and this is it initially spermaceti and other whale oils were very valuable for lighting and heating uh, like this is a candle wick put in eggshell from that spermaceti but it had many many other uses most valuable as a lubricant uh, rolls-royce transmission fluid brake fluid for um, just about every automotive, uh, automotive vehicle, uh, but many other uses. I'm not going to go into them. They're listed here. Uh, this is from Spermaceti. Also, many products. Uh, most people looking at this won't recognize these products, but uh, transmission fluid, brake fluid, pencils, so plant food, watch lubricant, gun lubricant, candles. Many products came from the Spermaceti. Okay, we will see if this works. Sperm whales. So I've been offshore in North Carolina and we usually see sperm whales around the continental shelf edge, especially off Cape Lookout. And uh, if we don't see them, it seems like we always hear them. And I've been on boats with acousticians who have hydrophones in the water 
and they're listening for them and recording them. And they tell me that day, night, all seasons, you can hear sperm whales. Whalers used to refer to them as the carpenter fish because the sounds they make sounded like a nail being hit with a hammer. If you're expecting melodic repeated, repeating humpback whale songs or a large repertoire of whistles and clicks like from a bottlenose dolphins, you'll be disappointed because um, this is a recording of sperm whales. So let's see if this works. So that was sounds from a small group, I think three or four sperm whales. We don't know what they're saying. We don't know what it means, but we think it's very, very important to their survival. This is the stomach contents of our sperm whale. Uh, there are a lot of parasitic, I think they're called nematode worms which is not alarming, doesn't uh, imply any kind of uh, distress or disease. And there were a lot of squid beaks, and that's what you see here. Uh, parasitic worms and squid beaks. This is the entire contents from the stomachs. Ryan and Michelle from UNCW were very excited to try to figure out what our whale had eaten. Of course, we don't know if it was like its last meal or things that have been in the whale for a week or a month or more, but um, but they were very interested in, in, in trying to help us understand what the whale had been eating. So they took the stomach contents and the most common food item in that whale's stomach was an umbrella squid. I think there were 600 individuals or 500 and something individuals of those. But the amazing thing to me is all the other stuff they found in the stomach. About 600 individual animals, prey items were in the stomach that included 19 species of squid. I didn't even know there were that many species of squid in the North Atlantic. <laughs> uh, and one species of octopus reflected by the beaks in the stomach of our sperm whale. Well, at some point, someone thought we should build a skeleton out of this specimen. And that person thought it should go on display in Beaufort. So we started making plans to collect the bones and we came up with the idea of burying the bones, but the whale was too heavy for all the vehicles we have to be able to tow it. So we ended up having to cut more flesh off, but we couldn't do it in a few days. It took a while. So we put up signs and put up barriers and uh, through successive days went out and cleaned more of the bones, separated the head from the body. And then eventually we were able to, with the kind assistance of the park service who loaned us a backhoe and a backhoe operator, we are able to drag the pieces of the whale up near a primary dune where the backhoe dug a grave. This is the uh, post head section. This is the head. And pushed the carcass into the well-organized grave lined with hardware cloth so we wouldn't lose any little bones. And that's where the carcass stayed for approximately four years. Four years later, we went back out with a team to dig up the whale and oh, there's Jim with a mask on, might be getting stinky. <laughs> um, and we did find the bones and those are the, some of the bones we pulled out, a couple shoulder blades, a flipper and uh, ribs, some of the lumbar vertebrae shown there. This is the uh, backhoe lifting the skull 
and upper jaw bones off the lower jaw bones. This is a picture of the bottom of the skull, a palate with still a lot of flesh on it, but um, the burial uh, worked very well. This is that same skull that was in the sling. It's right side up. Everything went wrong that day. Uh, donated four-wheel drive Mitsubishi, lost its four-wheel drive. First trailer we got to load the skull and other bones on um, broke, so we had to go to Harker's Island and get another trailer, and then we had to get the four-wheel drive backhoe to tow the Mitsubishi that was towing the skull trailer in this case. And eventually we got everything to the old Coast Guard dock and Cape Lookout Bite, and the Park Service loaned us a captain in a boat with a crane which lifted the skull on a mattress on the trailer onto the boat. And then back in Beaufort, um, on the museum's Gallant Channel property, we dug a pond and we lined it with pond liner. And we placed the skull on the pond liner filled the pond with water and went to the stables on Laurel Farm Road and got about 20 gallons of fresh horse poop. And it's a process called maceration and the anaerobic bacteria in the horse poop actually dissolved the remaining flesh that was on the skull. And so this is where the skull resided for about nine stinky months. And there it is. Meanwhile, Adrian was a science teacher and Angela was a Barton College science student and they wanted to help out. And this shows them making replicas of every tooth from our whale, all I think 42 teeth. They first made silicone molds of each one and then they're mixing the casting resin here. They pour the casting resin in a mold, wait about 15 minutes and Angela's holding the mold and Adrian's got her fingers on the resin too. And bingo, that is a perfect replica in size and shape of one of the teeth. And those are the entire set of teeth from this sperm whale in uh, resin replicas. And I'm very proud of their work. And this was a yeah, that was the result. And those are the teeth that are in the display at the Maritime Museum now. Meanwhile, while the teeth were being made and the skull was macerating, we got out all the rest of the bones and cleaned them, dried them, and weighed them. And this was the day that we spread them all out and weighed them. And I mentioned the asymmetry in the blowhole and in the skull, but here's something that I didn't predict. Every right rib is slightly heavier than the corresponding left rib. Each bone in the right flipper was a little heavier than the corresponding bone in the left flipper. I didn't expect that. Um, so this was a, an asymmetrical whale skeletally. I don't know if that's normal. I'm guessing it is. The Adventures of a Left Flipper. So I showed you a picture of Bruce cutting off the left flipper and Paul Nader, he's a veterinarian, and he offered to x-ray the flipper for us because he wanted to help us make a very accurate display. And he had put together a sperm whale and he was disappointed on how he did the flippers. So he said, Keith, let me x-ray the flipper for you and you'll get this right. So he did. And that's the result. The flipper of the sperm whale on the left, and I've placed it here next to the arm of uh, uh, an adolescent human. <laughs> uh, so you can see the similarities, five digits and radius and ulna and humerus in, in whales and humans. And that enabled Bruce and Pudge McCutcheon to actually build very accurate flippers by, act, by putting the real bone on plexiglass that was on top of the life-size x-ray. 
very proud of their work. Thank you. John Russell was so fascinated about the anatomy of the flipper, same bones that we have, that he said, Keith, can I make molds and replicas of a entire flipper? And that's what he did. So he's make he's just made a mold of an ulna on the left picture, and then the real ulna and the resin ulna, ulna are shown on the right side of this image. And the result of that work is this. And in real life, I would have a very hard time telling the difference between those resin bones that he's holding and real bone. Uh, he did a fabulous job. Bone inch barn raising. Well, we didn't have a place to do this work in Beaufort, North Carolina, so a bunch of donors and volunteers conspired and they built what we ended up calling Bonehenge. And it was a, it still is, a 40 by 20 foot pole barn, the construction of which was um, led by Vic and Laura Vassalino and uh, the buildings on Bruce McCutcheon's property, 22 volunteers in eight days. I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly. Day one, Framing, day two, more framing, day three, starting to look like a barn, putting in the windows, day four or five here, roofing, our roofing divas, <laughs> day six or seven, putting on the paint, day seven or eight, pouring the concrete floor, and there is the original bone henge on Bruce's property. And this is where we did most of the work assembling the bones of the sperm whale for display at the Maritime Museum. While we were building bone henge, I took all the bones to the NC State College of Veterinary Medicine and they were treated and they tried chlorethylene vapor degreaser at the anatomy lab there to very much do a better job cleaning the bones, getting the grease out. Because whale bones, especially sperm whale bones, are very greasy. And Jim is uh, soaking the bones after the degreasing in hydrogen peroxide to do some further cleaning, killing bacteria, dissolving proteins, and it lightens the color a bit. Some students built a rack to help us stay organized uh, and to dry the bones. Once the bones were all degreased and treated in peroxide and dried, Brooks and Nelson and others applied book binding glue, diluted book binding glue to keep the bones from getting chalky and uh, deteriorating. And also it strengthens the bones just a little bit. Josh is drilling holes from one vertebra to its neighbor. And we put a lot of uh, alignment pins in so that the uh, whale would not, the vertebrae won't rotate on the steel pipe on which the vertebrae were mounted. So these are just uh, alignment pins. He's drilling a hole for the alignment pins. That's the pipe I'm talking about. So David Brown is cutting the pipe right where it goes into the skull. It's a very surgical cut and, uh, and he's doing that well. Uh, I think it's inch and three eighths stainless pipe runs through the entire vertebral column. Gloria Moyer, a uh, speech therapist, was fascinated in hyoid bones and asked if she could work on them in our sperm whale. Sperm whales have very large hyoid bones in their throat and so that's what Gloria is doing. She did a great job. Dennis Chapman is a welder and he did fabulous work, uh, mainly uh, customizing support for the ribs, but also uh, making custom hangers for the specimen. Mary Hunnings painting bookbinding glue on the bottom of the skull in 
bone edge. Karen is putting the finishing touches on the teeth. Those are the resin teeth that Angela and Andrea made. And Karen also putting finishing touches on a flipper. Moving the bones into the Maritime Museum in March 2012. Carrying the lower jaws, the mandibles, with the painted resin teeth installed. Weighing each component before we installed it in the Maritime Museum. This is some of a more of welder Dennis Chapman's magic, uh, making these customized hangers that you can't see, but they're very strong and they go around the, uh, the steel support pipe. Paul's checking the rigging. We actually brought a scissor lift inside the Maritime Museum to do this installation. And I showed you a picture of the heart on the beach. And that heart had quite a journey, uh, studied, dissected, preserved, plastinated, and returned to the Maritime Museum. And so that plastinated sperm whale heart is currently on display beneath the whale skeleton from which it came. And that's a close-up of the heart. And early on, some of our volunteers told me to come up with a budget, what I thought it would cost to do this work. I had the privilege of doing it as a museum employee, so I, my labor was free and many volunteers helped. But this is the list of um, materials and services, supplies I came up with. There's a budget of about $50,000 I thought I could do this for. And uh, they said, we're gonna fund this by selling bones. And I said, wait, it's an endangered species. You can't sell bones. And uh, Nelson Owens explained to me, no, we're going to have people sponsor bones to fund this. And I said, wait, like they're gonna pay money, but don't get anything? It'll never work. Well, Nelson told me to tell him how many vertebrae, how many ribs, how many chevrons, how many pelvic bones, how many teeth, and so on. And I should assign a dollar value to each element. And that's what I did. And I came up with that list. So one of the 40 teeth, was $200, and if all the teeth were sponsored, we would get $8,000 from donors. The cranium, there's just one of those. It was the most expensive component, $5,000, and that was actually the first bone to be sponsored by the Todd Stewart Foundation in Florida. And the race was on. Um, just about everything got sponsored. And if we'd sold everything, the red number at the bottom was $50,200, enough to cover the budget. And it worked. The website raised a little over $37,000 from 160 people representing 12 states. The original budget, uh, I was very much under budget. So this was enough to cover it. Why was I under budget? Because so many things were donated, tools and supplies, uh, and we worked very efficiently, uh, and labor was donated that I intended to pay for, so we were under budget uh, for this project. And the donations ranged from $25 to that $5,000 cranium. So it worked. And I wanna give a, Fun shout out to you North Carolina drivers that have a Protect Wild Dolphins license plate because that helps fund this sort of work as well. We get, oh, between eight and $12,000 a year because of this North Carolina um, Protect Wild Dolphins license plate. So thank you. Uh, you'll look cooler, it'll make your car look better, go faster, last longer, and it does help the um, work with stranded whales and dolphins.
and many volunteers helped, and I've listed them all, no, probably not all of them. At the risk of leaving someone out, I've, risked, I've, li I've listed all that I kept track of, uh, and, and I lost track of how many hours they contributed, but thousands and thousands of hours. And the organizations uh, are listed below. Uh, all these people contributed to make this project successful. I'm very grateful and proud of their work. Thank you. And there you have it. So I hope you found this interesting or entertaining. And signing off for now, I'm Keith Rittmaster.